Hello, everyone. My name is Vitaly Wool, and um, this talk is about energy aware scheduler and things that are related to its development and current status. Uh, and I'll try to provide an unbiased look uh, on that very scheduler. Uh, we'll start with the introduction. Um, then we'll pass over to the EAS as such, uh, as it began. Then we'll talk about uh, the main sort of rival of EAS called the Qualcomm HMP scheduler. Uh, then we'll do some comparisons and figure out what the way forward was and wrap up. So nothing out of ordinary, um, but still, I thought it would be nice uh, to have some kind of a uh, summary slide in the beginning. Um, I'm representing Consulco Group, um, a services company specializing in embedded Linux and open source software, uh, doing hardware, software, build, design, development, and also training services. It's working off of San Jose uh, with the engineering presence worldwide. I think Matt, do we have presence in Antarctic? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Oh, so, 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 well, worldwide is a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, we're not covering Antarctic yet. Uh, also, I happen to mentor a group of postgraduate students uh, under the name of Interstate Labs, and that happens mostly in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, just for the record, these guys are not the guys that are tempering with the U.S. elections. Um, okay, so um, we're passing over to uh, the more important part of the introduction, uh, and that is uh, where the need for EAS, the Energy Wear Scheduler, came from. And to... Uh, be specific about that, uh, we need to consider uh, what's there in the kernel right now and what's prevailing, what's used by pretty much any appliance uh, that has Linux kernel inside uh, is called the completely fair scheduler, which main idea is to maintain balance or uh, in terms of CFS fairness in providing processor time to tasks. It maintains the amount of time uh, provided to a given task to determine if balancing is needed. Uh, and uh, the main structure uh, used in CFS is a time-ordered red-black tree, uh, which guarantees uh, high responsiveness and performance. And this is basically why uh, when the decision uh, was about to be made if to uh, implement a scheduler from scratch uh, for the needs of big little systems or to do something on top of CFS, uh, the decision was made in favor of CFS. So this is an important detail. CFS is a good scheduler. Um, CFS is sorting tasks in ascending order in that very red-black tree. And the leftmost task of the red-black tree uh, is picked up next uh, when uh, the decision uh, for, for, the next task, uh, sorry, for the next task uh, to be put on the CPU is made. That's because the leftmost task has the least spent execution time. And that is the very task that needs uh, fairness the most. What we also need to mention about CFS operation principles is that CFS uh, works with fairness not only to tasks but to CPU cores. So it considers all CPUs to be the same, which works very well in SMP systems, but in some more complicated cases that we'll be covering, it doesn't.
Okay, what are the cases? The main case that we'll be concentrating on is the big little architecture, which is a heterogeneous processor architecture which uses two types of cores uh, combined into clusters. So the little cores off of the so-called little cluster or silver cluster are designed for maximum power efficiency. And the big cores off of the big cluster or golden cluster in Qualcomm terminology should provide maximal computing power. And each task in the big little architecture may be scheduled for execution either on big or little core. There's no limitation to that. And the aim is for high peak performance with low mean power. So uh, big little architecture targets high peak performance with low mean power, which is specific uh, for battery-operated mobile devices, well, primarily Android devices. So if we take Big Little in a nutshell, the key, once again, is task placement. This is the key for high peak performance with low mean power, because wrong distribution of tasks between the cores will most likely kill uh, the big little advantages. So, with that said, big little puts high requirements on scheduler because the scheduler should be aware that there are two types of cores and while the cores are different, the power consumption of the cores are different, uh, the performance of the cores are different, so the scheduler should be energy aware and it should communicate with the dynamic voltage and scaling subsystem. And also, um, while scheduling, in fact, is always a bit of a crystal ball type of operation because you need to make a decision basing on the task's future activity, right? Uh, but in this particular case, it's even more like that because you need to account both uh, for tasks' demands and for possible power impact. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so, scheduler for big little. Can we use CFS? Well, CFS is a good scheduler, but it's not really a good fit for big little architecture because it's not energy aware. It doesn't know, uh, it cannot distinguish uh, between big cores and little cores. So once again, we want to use CFS because it's good, but we can't use it directly uh, because it lacks some important knowledge to make right decisions. So the idea was to extend CFS to be applicable to non-SMP and, well, first of all, big little architectures. And this work dates back to 2013. And uh, there were two main competing implementations. Uh, first came from Qualcomm, Cord Aurora, and the other one from Arm Linaro. And the latter one is called EAS, and we'll concentrate on that one. So let's pass over to EAS in detail. The basic principles of EAS are uh, that we need to schedule tasks considering energy implications. And the decision should be made basing on both topology and power management features. And that of course implies workload calculation um, and workload calculation within EAS um, is implemented independently or mostly independently. And in fact, it's using the calculations that have already been there uh, for CFS 
and those are called PELT or PELT, per entity load tracking. That's the scheduling feature that is already in mainline. It's been there since 3.8. And the main idea of PELT is that process can actually contribute uh, to load even if it's not actually running at the moment. So uh, it's calculated basing on the geometric series with the decay factor uh, when the total load is composed of the load uh, taken from the last sample plus uh, the decayed load from the previous sample plus the uh, double decayed load from the sample that was before the previous and so on and so forth, as you can see on the formula. And Q is the decay factor. And uh, PELT itself uses very soft decay factor so that the load contribution uh, halves after 32 milliseconds. Um, and this, this choice of Q is, well, and has never been obvious, but he has just followed what was there in the main line. And as you will see later in the slides, um, that didn't work exactly that well. Um, so, and then we have a very nice picture of how ES, uh, together with PELT, is operating. So if we are to schedule a task uh, to uh, a big little system, we pick the CPU, we pick the core with sufficient spare capacity and smallest energy impact. So if we look into this particular picture, then we can see that both little core number two and big core number two uh, can handle the scheduled task without uh, raising the operating frequency which is uh, represented by dashed line. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do know uh, that big cores are more power hungry, so if the task is actually fitting into one of the smaller cores, it will go into the smaller core, as opposed to CFS in this case, because CFS could equally well schedule this task on little core number two and big core number two, because for CFS, they would be equal. Okay. And now, let's take a quick look at what was happening in San Diego with Qualcomm and their scheduler. So the Qualcomm HMP scheduler, um, which is deciphered as Qualcomm heterogeneous multiprocessing scheduler, uh, even though there are alternative variants like Qualcomm high maintenance parachute. Um, that scheduler operates basing on similar principles, uh, but um, there are some significant differences uh, to Linero's EES, and we're gonna concentrate on these differences. In Qualcomm HMP scheduler, uh, the tasks are divided into groups uh, by importance, so there are less important and more important tasks, and by size, and well, when we speak about size of a task, we need to define that too, right? Uh, so size is a measure of load that this task produces, and task may be big when the load is big, little when the produced load is little, or other when it doesn't exactly fall in either of the two previous categories. And thresholds for defining uh, which tasks are big, which tasks are little, and which are neither of those uh, are parameterized. So there's a huge possibility of customizing QHMP depending on the system that you're running it on. 
and then scheduling a task, well, obviously should depend on its properties. Uh, and then again, uh, we need to define task size in a precise way. And it's done basing on the task demand calculation. Task demand calculation uh, is calculated basing on the formula that you can see. Uh, so it's delta time, the time of task running on a core in a period of time, uh, multiplied by the current frequency of this core, divided by the maximum frequency across all cores. So we do account for differences in maximum frequency between uh, the golden cluster and the silver cluster, just in case. And then, um, to be more stable, uh, we need to calculate uh, task demand over several sliding windows. Um, and this is also a parameter uh, called n. And usually, in most implementations, we set n equal to 5. And then we either calculate average demand or we take the maximum demand or we do some kind of combo uh, and some testing results showed that the best possible situation is when we calculate demand as being a maximum of the first demand in the series, the one that is most recent and the average calculated over all the samples. As I said, we already account for difference in maximum frequency between the big cluster and the little cluster, but we also need to account for high performance of big cores, even when they are operating on the same frequency. And then we uh, add a coefficient called max possible efficiency, and we scale demand according to that coefficient. Once again, it is also a parameter, uh, and it's usually set to two. So we consider, usually, we consider big cores uh, being twice as efficient as small core on the same frequency. So then, we have a pretty good understanding of what big and small tasks in QHMP actually are. So a small task would be a periodic task with short execution time, and a big task is a task producing high CPU load, well, being high CPU load, also a parameter, and usually it means around 90%. Um, in Android, there are some background threads that can become a big task if we only take CPU load, but we don't want to do that because we don't want to schedule background tasks on big cores. Uh, so the importance of the task should also be accounted uh, when we consider it as big. Once again, it is important to note that some tasks are neither big nor small, so we say they're other, and the tasks can change their size over time, while small tasks may become other, big tasks may become other. Basically, small tasks shouldn't become big, uh, and big tasks shouldn't become small, and if that happens in your system, then probably thresholds uh, were selected in the wrong way. Also, when we're speaking about QHMP, well, the high maintenance parachute, uh, we need to understand that it's tightly coupled uh, with the CPU frag um, governor called Interactive, which has never made its way in the mainline Linux kernel. So it's basically an out of tree governor. And then it was heavily patched by Qualcomm Code Aurora to communicate with the scheduler in the best way, or well, in the way they considered best. So this uh, created a pile of code that is not maintainable and not mainlineable. 
uh, although all for the good reasons. So QHMP is tightly coupled with heavily patched uh, governor. It, it, it says performance in the slides, that's not correct. Uh, it should be interactive. Sorry about that. Okay, now we're passing over to the fun part, comparisons. Uh, and the first one, the first comparison um, was to uh, measure power consumption for YouTube playback. And as you can see on the slide, there's a clear win in EES. EES is almost 20% uh, better in power consumption compared to QHMP when you do the YouTube playback. Um, the other tests showed roughly the same power consumption. But then we did another test for frame drops. And it turned out that when there is a burst to load, then EAS doesn't really work that well. For instance, uh, if we take the Chrome scrolling, which is represented on the slide, on the graph, uh, as the first two columns, uh, we can see uh, that EAS is more than twice worse than QHMP uh, in the number of frame drops. So the quality of service is actually degraded if we take EAS. Okay, here comes the grumpy cat. And we're really upset together with the grumpy cat because we don't know what to pick up. Because on one hand, EAS works best with a steady load, uh, showing excellent power consumption results and acceptable quality of service. But when it comes to burst to load, AES don't, doesn't cope that well. Uh, and well, then, then the QHMP seems to behave a lot better. So what to pick up? Let's try to summarize. QHMP has a strong focus on performance, while AES together with PELT, is more focused on power conservation. QHMP is complex, out of tree, uh, has obfuscated code, uh, very flexible, but not really maintainable, and couldn't ever be mainline. Also, it's worth to note that, well, with the flexibility of having many parameters to tune, uh, comes also an issue of combinations that have never been tested. And I think we got some feedback that it's around 90% of the combinations that have never been tested. So, well, that doesn't look too good. And EES is looking good, but it's not delivering the quality of service right. So once again, what to pick up? Uh, yes, uh, that, that's a very good question. You mean you mean the DK uh, coefficient, the Q, or? Maybe not just doing this DK, not polynomial. Maybe maybe some units to uh, uh, just to uh, to faster from the cars where demand is uh, high, is going higher. Because it's what we need for work. Right, right. Uh, if you if you don't mind. Uh, I will postpone this question because I believe the answer is given later in the slides. And if it doesn't, then you're very welcome to ask again, okay? Any other questions so far? Ben? Uh, well, well we, uh, we, we measure power, con well, it's not exactly power consumption, but we measure average current. 
So the, the result uh, was showing average current uh, per uh, the time of YouTube playback. Well, well uh, given that we use, well, well it, should, it should have been probably uh, said explicitly, but uh, we measured using the external battery, which maintains a stable voltage of 4.0. Uh, and with that said, uh, you, you, can, you can use uh, simple multiplication skills to, to, uh, to produce the, the power result. Uh, so um, this, uh, yeah, this probably had to be said, but uh, the result is in milliamps because we, uh, we measure uh, average current, uh, but it's easily uh, convertible uh, into the real power consumption because uh, the, the voltage is constant. Any other questions so far? Okay, so the way forward for EES um, was to move forward with EES because, well, it's maintainable uh, and uh, the code was a lot easier to learn and once again, um, EES stood the chance of mainlining while QHMP didn't. Uh, but what, what could we do uh, to improve it, to show better results uh, with regard to quality of service? And the answer was, well, we can use task demand calculation from QHMP. So we can take it off QHMP and use it as a separate module uh, replacing PELT. Uh, so here comes the Walt arrival to PELT, uh, which is window assisted load tracking. And in fact, it does implement in window demand calculation, which was previously implemented within QHMP. So here on the next slide, you can see uh, the block scheme uh, of updating uh, the task average demand um, explained or depicted in more detail. Um, so wh where the delta is the time of task running on the core in a period of time in a window. So if we are um, in the new window, uh, then we update the history. I think the no and yes here are mixed up, sorry about that, uh, but at least we can verify it now. So if, if this is a new window, then we update history, we drop the last sample, we move the, all the other samples uh, by one, and then we get the new sample uh, with the update history function. And if uh, this is not a new window, if we're executing from the window uh, that we've done some samples before, then we update the average. Uh, and thus, uh, we give the runnable sum variable, we get it, and it's the result uh, that we use for estimation of utilization of CPU. It's important to mention that we use samples obtained from the last window, not the current window, because for the current window, uh, we don't have all the results yet. Uh, well, what else? Walt is also tightly coupled with the CPU frac. It provides uh, data to CPU frag about the CPU utilization. Um, and it also notifies governor, the CPU frag governor, about inter-cluster migrations because uh, CPU frag governor operates only on a single cluster. So it operates, um, well, there are two instances of each governor, whatever governor you choose one operating on a big cluster and one operating on a little one, and they basically are agnostic about each other. So we need to 
notify CPU for a governor if we're transferring a task from one cluster to the other. And then we have a picture of CPU load tracking compared between Walt and Pelt. And they're really looking quite much the same, right? Especially if we take the upper ones. But if we magnify strongly, we can see that uh, Pelt is actually uh, ramping up slower and decaying slower also. There were also some initiatives to uh, change the decay factor, uh, which were not accepted that well by the community. Um, so, well, belt was considered to be obsolete, basically. And that's also the result interpretation. So now we have a happy animal uh, because now we get all the way to something that works equally well power consumption wise and uh, performance wise, quality of service wise, because Walt is ramping up and down faster and the fact that it's ramping down faster is also quite important for power consumption. And the way, the fact that it's ramping up faster is important for QoS. Uh, but still, given the possible spikes due to less stable operation of Walt, we were concerned about power consumption, possible increase in power consumption, but there were tests done uh, showing that there is no actual huge power consumption impact because we don't have the need for frequency boosting, which we had with EAS. Okay, the wrap up. Uh, there is a nice summary between Pelt and Walt uh, put together in a table, uh, but that, that slide, I'm really, uh, I don't feel the need to read it. Uh, it's, it's there for your convenience and for my convenience. If you want to ask some questions about it, you're very welcome. Otherwise, I'll just pass over to the current status of EAS. And the current status is that Walt has become the first and main choice for it due to the reasons that we have talked about just recently. And first of all, the better QoS, but also uh, that there is no power degrade. And uh, EAS Walt is effectively EAS plus the task accounting from QHMP. So whatever bad words uh, I had said about QHMP in the past, uh, well, actually, uh, a huge pile of code from QHMP uh, turned out to be useful and important. Uh, and also, um, it's always a good thing when two competing implementations converge uh, and the resulting implementation takes the best out of two worlds. So that's, that's how uh, open source should work. That's how collaboration should work. Uh, and yeah, that's just a good thing. Um, there are still some small things, some small deficiencies that we believe are there for the current EAS slash Walt implementation. Um, and <laughs> as a funny thing, uh, those are the deficiencies uh, that were not there in QHMP. For instance, uh, there is no notion of big and small tasks in EAS. And sometimes, sometimes uh, that leads to suboptimal results. For instance, uh, when we consider AES and task packing. Uh, as you know, due to the algorithms, AES wouldn't pack a task if that would mean raising CPU frequency. But on the other hand, uh, 
as shown uh, on the graph to the left. The power consumption uh, may be bigger uh, if we have uh, two cores operating on a smaller frequency as opposed to a single core on a slightly higher frequency. That changes when the frequencies are rising, but uh, on small frequencies, that is usually the case. So sometimes uh, it is actually better to pack tasks, uh, even though packing would mean raising a frequency uh, for the CPU that the task ends up upon, uh, as opposed to having two CPUs running at the same time. For instance, uh, on the picture to the right, we can see that uh, the second small CPU uh, is basically unused. So it's better to switch it off uh, and put the task being scheduled on the first CPU, provided that the frequencies are low enough. But we cannot do it in EAS because there is no such algorithmic code in EAS. And we could do it in QHMP because if the task is small, it would have been placed like that. Oops. Conclusions. Um, well, we were speaking about Big Little and EAS, and EAS is the primary choice for Big Little architectures, and, well, Big Little architecture puts high demand on the system software, and especially on the scheduler, and also on, on the uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling implementation. So, given those high demands, uh, it's hard to be perfect, right? And EES is not perfect, but it is still the way to go. And this, I believe, is the unbiased view on EES. Okay, uh, as the last thing, I would like to thank people who are not there, but who were helping me out uh, making this presentation. Uh, Vlad Reski, uh, I'm working with him in Sweden. Uh, on multiple projects uh, related to Android power and performance optimizations. Uh, Anton Ogarov, that's one of the students I've been talking about in the beginning of my talk. Uh, Dani Nikludova, uh, who made the pictures of happy, not so happy animals that I used in my slides. And then my wife, uh, who's also an inspiration for me and she also shown uh, a lot of patience while I was preparing the slides. Uh, and also, I would like to thank you all for the attention. Uh, this presentation is over, and you're very welcome to ask any questions you have. Yes, please. Well, well uh, uh, preference to keep uh, a CPU on a core to, to keep the cache as hot uh, is definitely a good thing, and it's implemented, I think, in, in, in yeah, it's implemented in the latest ES anyway. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it was there at the time we tested ES Belt versus QHMP. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the, the main problem for frame drops was different, and that was uh, that the CPU wasn't ramping up very quickly. Uh, because, I mean, we need to raise the frequency if the load goes beyond a certain threshold. And uh, the data uh, that Pelt was supplying to the DVFS uh, was lagging in time. So we, we had bursty loads, but the CPU frequency wasn't traced in a timely manner. Does this answer your question? And when 
that depends on the architecture and it depends on uh, on operating point that we're switching from and to. Uh, usually, if we need to raise the voltage, then it takes a significant while. Well, I mean, significant in terms of microseconds. Uh, if if we don't have to raise the voltage to jump from one OPP to another, then it's usually quite fast. Yes, please. Uh, well, well uh, the, the energy costs are uh, part of part of EES, uh, and, and it was in um, in one of the first slides uh, uh, when when we were uh, talking about uh, putting a task either on one of the available big cores or one of the available little cores. Um, speaking about shutting down, ramping up uh, a certain CPU. Um, that's also the thing uh, that's related to CPU idle. Um, so that's that's another mechanism in the kernel. And um, I, I believe uh, this goes a little bit beyond the the goal of his goal of his presentation. Um, this this is a complicated well, not that complicated, but this is a separate thing, and uh, we can discuss it later because otherwise I believe it will take some minutes to complete. Ben? Um, that's, that's a good question, but uh, I believe it needs uh, some kind of uh, extra definition. Uh, are you talking about um, an HMP system that is running uh, a basic CFS scheduler, or are you talking about EAS uh, running on an SMP, not HMP system? Well, it, it depends. It depends. Depends on the load. Depends on the type of operation. Uh, if if we take if we take the uh, scrolling in Chrome type of thing that uh, EES was lagging quality of service wise compared to QHMP, uh, then there's going to be a huge difference in power consumption to uh, go all the way up to the same quality of service if we just if we just use CFS. Uh, for for other loads, there can be a uh, smaller difference. So it's it's about energy awareness, right? Um, any other questions? Yes, please. You mean you mean uh, it's possible to configure QHMP so that it's more power conserving and less performance oriented, right? Uh, yes, yes, uh, that's that's true. Of course, uh, ES also has some parameters, uh, even not in such large number as QHMP. Uh, 
but to to go all the way up to the quality of service that QHMP was able to provide, um, we needed to turn uh, boosting uh, for uh, for the bursty loads, um, which is also I mean it's it's also a, a parameter. Uh, but if we turn on boosting, then the, the whole um, advantage uh, of uh, AES uh, that was there in terms of power consumption goes away. And in fact, uh, in most cases, uh, it becomes inferior to QHMP in terms of power consumption because we, we just, no, we, we, we basically just uh, uh, have all the frequencies up just, just because we uh, do not rely on uh, getting uh, the information about CPU load in a timely manner. So we mitigate that uh, by uh, just turning the frequencies up if we see that the Chrome is launching, right? So that, that's, uh, that is basically a method, but it's more of a workaround, right? Yes, please. That's a very interesting thing to, to try out, but we, we were really concentrating on embedded stuff. Any other questions? Yes, please. I need to double check. I don't think it made much difference. I, I, I don't think so, no. Any other questions? Well, I guess not. Well, thanks again for your attention.